Hello everyone, welcome back. So, so right now we'll be uh, going forward with the sec next session. The session is about Python and data, storytelling to the risk. Let's avoid more deaths by PowerPoint. This awesome talk will be delivered by Sebastian. He's here. Let's welcome Sebastian on the stage. Thank you. So, death by PowerPoint. Now, a painful experience caused by a long, boring presentation with too many slides filled with text, small fonts, and endless bullet points. Blah, blah, blah. I, I hope that is a good example of what a boring presentation is, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, see also meeting purgatory, presentation torture, and other synonyms. So, uh, the title of my talk is Avoiding Death by PowerPoint, uh, Data Storytelling and Python to the Rescue. And just to be fair, uh, deaths by PowerPoint, by PowerPoint are not caused by the software. It's the speaker that lacks the data storytelling tools and skills to make it more engaging. So it's not all the fault on uh, PowerPoint and similar software. My name is Sebastian Flores. Uh, you can find me as Sebastiandres on most sites. Also, you can uh, find me on GitHub, Twitter, LinkedIn, and so on. I'm part of the Python Chile team organizing the PyCon Chile and PyDay Chile events. Uh, I also collaborate with the libraries Streambit and Visu. And my real job is a chief data officer at a company called uPlanner. So let's review in detail every single thing that I will cover on the presentation. <laughs> so, storytelling principle number one is never give away the ending, never kill the surprise or the suspense. Don't give up the reveal. No book or jokes uh, starts by revealing the ending, so why would you? Uh, only explain the content if it raises the stakes, if it makes it more interesting in some way. So why data storytelling to begin with? So people have been telling stories since the beginning. Uh, it's just because the way our brains work. Uh, stories are sort of natural built-in technology in the sense that they allow for uh, knowledge transmission. It allows for collective learning, it allows for cooperation at small and large scale. Uh, and stories are not a random collection of facts. Uh, there's a very specific order. You have a start, a conflict, a conflict resolution, and an ending. If you mix that, even if you have the right facts, you don't end up with a story. So actually, that's the pattern that the brains crave. Uh, and uh, it's because it can learn from it. Uh, it's a, a tool that helps human learn. Uh, and that's why we consume so many stories in so many different forms. So when you're not working, you're probably reading, watching a movie, a TV series, or whatnot. You're always consuming stories because it's what brains like to do. Uh, so what do we do when we know how something works? We hack it, of course, right? Uh, the pick and rule is uh, something actually very fun to use. You remember something for uh, two things, mostly. The most intense emotion and how it ended. And you can use this to build your presentation around these two facts. Uh, let me give you uh, an example if you're not convinced. So we collectively, as a society, enjoyed uh, seven seasons of this great TV series and can you guess which one? You can shout it if you know. It was Game of Thrones, of course, right? Uh, now, the whole Game of Thrones uh, TV series will be remembered but the no, not so great ending uh, and some peak scenes. Do you remember the Red Wedding? That was crazy. Uh, what was really interesting uh, is that this is not symmetrical. We can forgive a TV series for having one, even two bad seasons at the beginning, but never at the end. So endings matter. 
and endings matter in stories and in presentations. So always make sure to have a, a to craft your presentation around a peak emotion and a great ending. We are only as good as our communication skills. Uh, you can be really good, the best in your field, but if you cannot articulate your thoughts, if you, not, if you cannot communicate your ideas effectively, you'll only be as good as someone who's kind of bad, but communicates perfectly. So communication is important. And I think of storytelling as a bag of tricks you can use to make better presentations. Presentations that will be remembered. Presentations that will change something in your audience. And this is important. Uh, if you think of uh, Sherlock Holmes on Dr. Watson, it's sort of the idea I have of data science and data storytelling. So someone is solving the problem, but you also need someone who's telling the, the solution in an engaging way. Uh, we remember Sherlock Holmes not because he was a genius, but because Dr. Watson shared an interesting story for us to remember. The key point here is emotions create actions. No revolution has started with data. They start with emotions. Now, let me give you another example. Would you agree to spend 10 minutes to share on social media some statistics that a company made for you? No? Well, you probably did without knowing it. Uh, you probably remember Spotify Wrapped. Uh, these are actually my statistics. Um, and you can certainly remember how you felt after you saw your uh, yearly data analysis. After all, it's just data stats. Uh, but it feels more than that. It feels uh, like you learn something from the process. Uh, I always learn something about my musical taste uh, and it's weird to see how it changed over the years. But anyway, it's engaging because it's told as a story. It's not just cold numbers, it's something you want to share because it's meaningful. So uh, let's review the first tool I want to uh, show you and see how visualization and storytelling are related. So uh, there are many data exploratory tools. Uh, you have Google Looker, you have Tableau, you have Power BI, uh, and as the name suggests, they are great tools to explore the data. Uh, and this is a previous step for telling a story. This is the, the equivalent of doing the footwork of a, a news reporter. You're getting on the street, getting the news, knowing what's important. But exploratory visualization is just the first step. You need to craft what you want your audience to see. Uh, something very important is, in general, there are too many options in these visualizations, and the user cannot be held responsible for finding the insights. You, as a speaker, have to direct the attention where it's important. So the storytelling, storytelling principle number two is, details are important, but not all details are important. So you have to find which ones make up for the, the core of your story. Uh, on writing, this is a, a, a famous principle, it's called Chekhov's gun, which is, essentially says that if you're describing a gun in a wall, uh, then that gun must to be shot at some point. Otherwise, it's a detail that's irrelevant to the story, and it makes brain complain because it was irrelevant. Um, now, to do data explanatory visualizations, we have so many good libraries in Python. We have the old classic Matplotlib. Uh, we have Seaborn, Plotly, Altair, Bouquet, Plot9, Pygal, and so many others. I'm probably missing some of them here. And uh, my advice would be pick one and master it. Because you need to escape from the default settings to do real uh, data storytelling. Default settings are good, but they're not enough. So you will really need to be able to imagine something and construct it with the library. 
and just knowing the basics of the library will not be enough. So master one tool before learning another one. Now let me share you an example from my favorite uh, books on data storytelling. Here you can see a visualization of, uh, of some data with uh, standard default configuration of the library. And there's nothing wrong with it. But you can agree it's very boring, right? Now, let's see uh, a different visualization for the same data, but uh, that reveals the story behind the numbers. So uh, you can see things in a completely different perspective. You only put numbers where they are relevant, and you highlight and you put uh, the information close to the relevant parts of the graph, and you hide things that are not relevant. Um, you put numbers where they are needed and call for an action. So the main takeaway here is don't share numbers. Share a story. And that's the book. So let me share you uh, another library uh, called Visu. Uh, that allows to do data storytelling in JavaScript or Python. Uh, this is an example that I created yesterday, uh, so I hope it doesn't fail. Uh, it's based on the numbers on Wikipedia and the numbers that Marietta gave us yesterday on the opening. And as you can see, the uh, attendance for the PyCons over the years, the PyCon US, have uh, raised until COVID hit us. And this is very interactive, it's very nice. And you can uh, see how things are, uh, depend on the type of attendee. Uh, now, maybe we want to concentrate on the last four years to see what's the trend. And so you can filter and see things moving around nicely. And maybe you, we want to see if uh, relatively the uh, online attendance is decreasing. And yeah, it seems like it. So who can blame them? It's much better to be on site for the PyCons. Now, let's discuss another AI tool, uh, which is uh, related to the storytelling principle number three, uh, that says that your first draft is always going to be terrible. So you just have to put it out there and iterate over it. And I want to relate this to artificial intelligence because uh, AI can be a great source of inspiration. Uh, it can speed you up to make uh, the first version of your presentation faster. It's useful to create images uh, to complement your talk and illustrate your points. You can use it to get ideas, descriptions, whatnot. Uh, so your first, first draft can be out there very, very quickly. But you have to think of AI as a good friend who gives you very good and very bad ideas. Mostly bad ideas, but sometimes things are good. Uh, it's up to you to select what's good and to uh, use it to create a better presentation. Uh, for every single image I put on my presentation, there are probably 20, 30 other images I didn't use because I didn't like them. Uh, but I could get some nice images to very specifically illustrate the points, the points I wanted to make. Now let's move over to presentation software. And I think this is one of the tools where you can improve the most, uh, so pay attention. Um, the fourth and final storytelling principle is show, don't tell. Uh, and this storytelling principle is one of the simplest, but also one of the hardest to achieve. Uh, let me give you an example, okay? So tell me if you can uh, spot the differences between these two examples. So the first, first one is Guido was happy because he solved the bug on his code. And then we have Guido's eyes lit as the terminal finally executed without errors. A white green spread across his face. He jumped from his head, chair, fist raised in triumph. Yes, he exclaimed. Uh, they're very different. You cannot tell someone to feel someone. 
You can paint an image and give them the means and the reasons to feel something, but you cannot tell them to feel something. And this is related to presentation tools because the classic presentation tools allows you to tell stuff, so PowerPoint and, and similar software, but they're not very useful to share code or share stuff that's alive, that's close to us programmers. Um, uh, you have uh, the tools that I call show, don't tell, that are Quarto, Jupyter, Plus Rise, and Streamlit. You have other tools, of course. And to be honest, I like to fine tune my presentation till the last minute, midnight, uh, inserting, uh, changing the code, fine tweaking, and uh, inserting code snapshots into the presentation each time you update something is not fun, and it's a recipe for disaster. But if you can have code on one side and the presentation on the other side to update automatically, that's very nice to have. And it helps you do better presentations because you can iterate more quickly. Um, there are these uh, show don't tell tools that I've been using for a while and they're uh, very fun to use. And I have not seen the community adopt them as uh, they could. So hopefully uh, that might change. So the first one is Quarto, which is a project from POSIT. Uh, they actually have a booth down there, so go get some stickers. Uh, the idea is that you create a plain markdown file. So the files and the repo is always clean. Uh, it's always well-defined. Uh, it's easy to maintain. And you can do pretty much anything, uh, websites, books, uh, presentations, of course. And uh, you can copy and paste the code. It's uh, very reusable uh, and quite incredible. Uh, actually, this presentation has been made in Quarto. Uh, and the idea is that you have the markdown that you have to render into an HTML, HTML page with the reveal.js uh, library. But it's just a web page, so you can share it with anyone you need. And uh, very good. You can also export it to PDF, but you're going to have some more static output. Uh, and for instance, here on the left, I have a small example of the code. Uh, as you can see, we define some configuration uh, stuff on the, um, for the presentation. So we get a menu. We, we have a table of contents, if you want that kind of stuff. Uh, you can define the theme, the transition, and whatnot. Uh, and the code for getting this slide is just putting the content. So you sort of uh, isolate the content from the uh, configuration, from the settings, from the style. And that's very nice to do. Uh, and if you need something uh, a little more complex, like having incremental points, you just define the incremental points here. And it has lots of configuration. It's actually a very nice library. Uh, so uh, go try it. Uh, the only thing it cannot do is do real-time execution. So I cannot execute code on this presentation directly. But we have a library for that. So mostly we all know about Jupyter Notebooks or Jupyter Lab. Uh, and there's an extension for Jupyter, which is called RISE, that allows to transform a Jupyter Notebook into a presentation. Um, you will have to manually define each cell to be a part of the slide or a speaker note or just to skip it. Uh, but the nice part is that after you have uh, completed the content and classified the cells, you can just push a button and it will start a presentation. And on this presentation, you will be able to execute any code that your kernel supports. So it's very helpful for workshop tutorials and whatnot. The only problem is that it's not uh, so easy to uh, configure. So tweaking the uh, backgrounds and stuff, uh, you end up having to work too much with JavaScript and HTML and CSS, and uh, that's not so patronistic. But if you want a clean presentation and being able to uh, execute the code is a great, great solution. And then you also have other tools like Streamlit. So Streamlit is a Python library to build 
uh, Python web apps. It's very fast and very Pythonistic. They also have a booth down there. And it's probably not the library that you would expect to see for presentations. But there are some crazy people. Uh, it sometimes, it just makes sense. Uh, I did a presentation on PyCon Chile on 2021 about Streamlit. So I was presenting Streamlit in Spanish. And it felt natural to use the library to explain the library, because otherwise I would have to be juggling between the presentation and the code, and it was messing around. But I could use Streamlit to build a presentation and show the code right away. And uh, this was uh, worked very well. Uh, I actually kept working on, on this. I uh, shared two libraries, uh, Streamlit Book and Streamlit Slide, that helped building on top of Streamlit. Um, but the main point, again, here is show, don't tell. On presentation about code, don't tell me how it works. Show me how it works. So my decision flow to choose a presentation software uh, goes as, well, PowerPoint, if it's, if it's a single use, no code presentation, uh, maybe my boss asked me to do a presentation for tomorrow, I'll just use PowerPoint just to finish quickly. Um, Quarto for talks from related documents and where executing code on real time is not needed. Uh, Jupyter and Rise for workshop, classes, tutorials, where executing code is important uh, because I want to show on my screen the same things that people are experiencing on their computers. And I want to do things very, very live, very interactive. Uh, and then Streamlit, if you're half crazy, if you want customized experimental presentations, that's also a tool. Uh, Streamlit or any other web page, you can use it as a, uh, as a presentation software. Nevertheless, I always try to follow the data storytelling principles, because those are the same regardless of the software you're using. Um, it's just the software that changes. And I have to confess, my slides are kind of my babies. Uh, I spend too much time on them. I, they keep me awake at night. Uh, I, I tweak, I change diapers every day. Uh, and uh, changing stuff that maybe only I will notice. Uh, but it's fun to push software beyond the limits, know where the limits are. Uh, and I think people can notice when you put love into the things you, you show. Uh, so let's wrap up. Uh, let me share two stories with you. So the first one is what's storytelling to me? For me, data storytelling has been a sort of revelation. It has become sort of this missing piece, this unified model for communication, science, programming, books, pretty much anything we do as humans. Uh, and I hope that during this talk, I have convinced you to learn about data storytelling, to add this as a tool to your set of tools and skills. Uh, I think it's going to become a very important uh, tool in the future. So invest some time on it uh, now. And I believe that data storytelling is a very, very valuable skill. Uh, using uh, some of these tools and skills can help you craft better presentations and make your ideas shine, you can become uh, a better presenter, a better speaker. So learn a new skill. Uh, learn about storytelling or data storytelling or Quarto, Jupyter plus Rise or Streambit. Uh, and uh, I want to make the, the invitation to propose a talk for next event, small or big. Uh, you'll never not have fear of presenting. It's part of the nature as humans. And I think of uh, speaking at uh, events like this just like uh, going to a roller coaster. Uh, it's always scary, but you push through the fear because you never know what's going to happen. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad I'm going to meet new people that think that uh, storytelling is valuable, so I think I'll have interesting conversations, and I hope uh, you will too with your uh, specific projects. So uh, if you like the talk, and especially if you hate the talk, share your thoughts. Uh, I love getting feedback because it has helped me improve my skills. So all this material is on GitHub. Uh, and I'll 
share a survey so you can provide me some feedback. Um, you can, if you want to keep in touch, if you want me to send you a personal email from my personal address so we can keep in touch, I'll be happy to, and I'll share the links and everything. It, all this is optional, so if you don't want to answer anything, that's okay. So thanks for coming to my talk you have there. I'll, keep some, uh, I'll do some book recommendations. So for storytelling, uh, my favorite book is a Story Worthy by Matthew Dix. You can actually find him on YouTube sharing some stories, and he's a wonderful storyteller. Uh, and the book is packed with storytelling wisdom, uh, great stories. It's so much fun to read, so that would be uh, very useful if you're starting on uh, storytelling as a, as a subject. And then for data storytelling, uh, you have Storytelling with Data from Col Nussbaumer. Uh, it's a very, very well-written book, very technical. It goes step by step on the thought process of doing a good visualization. So if we just want to do uh, better presentations and better data presentations, that's the one you need. Uh, and I think that's all. Thanks. Are there any questions? Yeah? There are two mics on the hallway. Actually, I got a question for you. Hey. Um, the agenda was, the cutting out the agenda was actually I was just uh, thinking about that more, and um, one of the things that I do when I present is form context as the first thing to try to get people into, you know, that storytelling mentality so that you're, they're just not lost at the beginning, but you're kind of suggesting not to have that, or maybe I should ask, are there ways where you can apply that context without yeah giving away kind of no, that, what you're going to talk about? I, I get it. That's very a very polemic subject uh, on, on the talk. Uh, the main idea is that you don't want to give away the reveal, the, the ending of your talk. So having an, a, an agenda where you highlight sort of the structure is OK, but uh, it's a bit boring. So you may want to hide some details. But never start a presentation saying, I'm going to show you why we have 20% increase in sales. Because all the rest of the presentation is just going to be a filler. It's just going to be you know, a justification for the number you just mentioned. So you have to sort of tell the struggles, the problems, tell a story, and then end up with a big reveal at the end. So it's more than a choice. But uh, I would say that mostly every single slide on your presentation should have a meaning, should have been crafted in some sense, because you want to do something with that particular slide. So if you uh, put a, an agenda uh, that's useful for the development of the talk, that's great. It's not that you always have to skip it, but it has to have an intention. Great. Thank you very much. No problem. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, you mentioned that Jupyter and RISE allow for interactive uh, code execution uh, and also just need looking slides. I think that's a great idea, but you also mentioned that it can be very difficult to set up. Are you familiar if there exist any sort of like preset configurations that out in the GitHub world that we can download so we don't have to do all that CSS and Yeah, and so, so that's a good point. I, I'm not bashing Jupyter plus RISE. I have used them for plus than 10 years than courses on them. The point is that I want to be able to do stuff like this, you know, putting specific backgrounds and, uh, you know, tweaking the, the library. If you just want to use, like, the custom themes, it's okay. You, you can do it in five minutes. But, you know, tweaking it to your particular needs, it's going to take time and you'll have to deal with HTML, CSS, and that's not the fun part, but Understood. at least for me. <laughs> Understood. Thank you. Yeah. But it's very easy to use. You just pip install the library and it works perfectly. 
Thanks for this. This was really great. Um, one thing I struggle with is understanding ahead of time. Sorry, can you remove it? Sorry about that. Um, thanks for this. It was great. One thing I struggle with is knowing what types of visualizations are going to resonate with my audience as I'm making the presentation. It often really surprises me what people dive into because I thought it was too busy and their eyes would glaze over versus what just falls flat. Do you have any advice about how to understand what's going to appeal to different audiences as well? Yeah, that's, that's a problem. So when you have a broad audience, you have to focus on someone. Uh, because if you just uh, do a general presentation, everyone's gonna be underserved. Uh, so you have to realize who's the hero of the talk. Who are you talking to, you, really? Uh, maybe in a, a talk about uh, with your boss and your colleagues and the CEO of the company, you have to choose which is the person that needs to uh, get the most important story and craft the presentation around it. But, it, I mean, it's all about uh, balance and compromise. Not, there's no uh, uh, answer I can give you, like <laughs> a uh, uh, um, solution for every problem. We have to stop. Hey there, um, that was a great talk. Um, I like your principles because I was always taught that when you make a presentation, the number one principle is you tell people what you're going to tell them, then tell them, and then tell them again. Um, well, my question specifically is that you were talking about the Python libraries and that you should just master one of them. That, that, I think that's what you said. Well, let's talk about these tools. Could someone just become like so good at PowerPoint that they're like an expert that they don't, they don't need these other tools, that they're, they're just like so good at it that they can tell any story? You think so? Yeah, that's true. And uh, I follow some people that are great on PowerPoint, on Instagram, because I learn more, more tricks. Uh, I mean, software is just the tool for your needs. Uh, what I'm proposing is that if you're talking about code, it's easier to use a software that's closer to the code, mm -hmm. because it, you're going to spend less hours. So for instance, the animation I showed, it's code. So I only work on the same presentation all the time, and I don't have to go back and forth uh, recording like the animation and then putting it on the presentation. It's easier to have everything closer. But you have software that's better suited for some task and software that's suited for other tasks. For, I would say for presentations on uh, some, something related to coding where you want to show code, uh, it, this is going to be easier because you're going to work less. Okay, thank you. So if anyone has more questions, I'll be around. Thank you.